Hello, I'm your mum, and today we're going to talk about Depression the role-playing game. I mean, Wraith the Oblivion. Wraith is a fascinating element of the World of Darkness setting, not just on a conceptual level, but also mechanically. Because instead of playing your character, you kind of play half of your character and also half of someone else's character. Right, so that's probably not entirely proportional. You kind of play like four-fifths of your character and one-fifth of someone else's character. We're gonna get back to this. But first, what even is a wraith? Well, a wraith is a ghost like a dead person. Which, yes, does mean that you start every game of Wraith as someone who is already dead. But don't worry, Death 2 is definitely an option that is in the cards for you. The reason I chose to do a deep dive into this one out of all of the World of Darkness systems that exist is because, let's be honest here for a moment, most World of Darkness systems kind of, in practice, orbit around Vampire the Masquerade. And wraiths are the beings that vampires, specifically the kind of vampires that you might actually get to play, have the highest likelihood of having interesting interactions with that are not, you know, entirely campaign upending. Even a single werewolf is likely to turn a coterie of fledglings into lunch. Hunters are always harbingers of an impending apocalypse because they tend to have the second inquisition riding hot on their trail. Mages are completely unpredictable and changelings are just plain weird. And let's not even talk about like demons and mummies and shit. Now in fairness you don't need any of these to run a great Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle. Probably like 90% of World of Darkness games are designed to basically run with themselves as closed ecosystems, interacting only with the beings that that particular game is about. Different kind of supernatural beings don't really know all that much about each other, and so they also kind of try to stay out of each other's way. However, I don't think it would be too much of an understatement to say that pretty much all Vampire Chronicles feature some type of haunting at some point during the Chronicle. It's just gonna, even if it's like a small side quest to break up the pace a little bit, add a little, little extra spice, it tends to happen. Two of the 13 clans, the Hakata and the Lasombra, actually have the signature powers that very strongly interact with the world of Wraith. It is no accident that the discipline that these two clans share in Vampire 5 is called Oblivion. It is the Oblivion from the game title, Wraith the Oblivion. So if you want to run a vampire campaign, you want to know stuff about at least one other World of Darkness setting, because I know it's incredibly daunting to even look at all of them, and few even very experienced uh, storytellers, game masters, really know all of them. Make it be this one. You don't need to be super familiar with the lore of Wraith, to run it properly in Vampire the Masquerade. You can just freehand it if you want to. Not only is probably no one going to notice because way too few people are into Wraith, even though it's so incredibly cool. It's also playing it in a manner that's a bit wrong and mysterious to a large extent is kind of key to the whole World of Darkness game experience. Not to mention that the kind of wraiths that vampires are likely to interact with are probably more outsiders, small minorities within the larger society of the dead. And these are the dead, they're not the undead like vampires. Wraiths are dead. Also, very important caveat before you watch any of this, there's really no guarantee that any of the information presented here is current and accurate to the lore as it stands right now within World of Darkness because the meta plot of Wraith has concluded, if you will, and it's sort of maybe ended in the destruction of the underworld. Not in like the complete annihilation sense, but in the like Hurricane Katrina sense. But given how fast and loose World of Darkness plays it with its world building consistency and its contradictions and like the shit that you're allowed to do for your own individual chronicle, honestly, 
you can just use the information you find here to run a current day not in the 90s game. Most importantly though, if you really want a very interesting gaming experience, give Wraith a try. And folks, I also have to start this one off with a massive trigger warning. Wraith the Oblivion is, more so than any other game I have seen, about death and dying. It is the alpha and the omega of the theming and the mechanics and how everything revolves around everything else. I mean, you literally start the game dead. It's about fucking ghosts. No, look, it's not about fucking ghosts, it's you're a dead person is what I mean. So we will be talking about homicide, suicide, genocide, murder-side. Any word you know that ends up inside, good to fair chance, it's gonna come up. East side, west side, it's all there. And all of that is brought to you by today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. I'm just kidding, it's my Patreon patrons. And also the one guy who still supports me on Subscribestar, even though that platform is basically dead. It still works fine, so keep fighting the good fight. Look, I don't really do sponsorships anymore. I find them pretty annoying, and they always come off as, like, somewhat disingenuous. I mean, of course, you know, if you're a creator, by all means, do them if, if that's what you feel like you need to do. Secure that bag. We do, after all, live in a sort of society type situation. Me, because I'm stupid, I rely on the generosity of a bunch of cool people who like to chip in a buck or more every month. Look, I would do sponsorships for something that I genuinely really enjoy, although I have also kind of said no to some of those in the past, but mostly when people hit me up for sponsorships, aside from the few gems that I throw out occasionally, it's like travel agencies for some reason. They hit me up every week and are like, look, that you really need to, we want you to do a read where you really stress the fact that the whole thing were a whole group of travelers we sent overseas and they drowned in a shipping container. That only happened like 12 times. And I, I don't want to stand for that. So I don't know, maybe if Maltesers were to hit me up and maybe also pay me in Maltesers or whoever makes Lambrusco wine. But because that's not going to happen, uh, Go ahead and support me on Patreon. Link is going to be down in the doobly-doo, the description. Patreon.com slash Burger Creek. Let's start the show! So, you died. Don't worry, it happens to the best of us. But what you didn't do is resolve your business on Earth, I mean, sorry, the skin lands, as you will be calling it from now on, in a satisfactory manner. In fact, you're still very much tied to those things. You might call them fetters that anchor you to the world of the living. No, no, seriously, that's what they're called. These are uh, places, things, people, even organizations that exist in the skin lands that stand for some sort of conflict that we as the dead still have to resolve within ourselves. By binding you to the skin lands, these fetters solidify your very existence in the underworld. They are the only places where a wraith can recover from the hardships of being dead by slumbering within their essence. As a result of that particular predicament type situation, you are one of the few unlucky individuals who didn't immediately transcend to, well, you know, whatever happens when you die. Because you are out here, trapped in this dreary pseudo-reflection of the real world called the Shadowlands. Trapped inside a cocoon of ectoplasm called a core. And the Shadowlands are not the afterlife. The Shadowlands are, if you want to sort of drastically oversimplify it, purgatory. And you will be here until you have managed to transcend. Or until you slip up and, you know, fall. In order to sustain their ephemeral existence, wraiths need to acquire pathos, which is sort of emotional energy that is gained through experiences relating to their passions, which often represent the goals one failed to achieve in life. It is essentially the vitae, the blood of Wraith, if you will, uh, but it's gained through inducing emotional experiences, or also some also drain it. Uh, that's pretty frowned upon though, generally speaking. And it actually, physically, in a sense, makes up the atoms. They're not atoms, actually. They're not really atoms. 
that are the wraith's corpus, their body. A wraith is born, essentially, with a corpus that looks like what they looked like at the time of death. But as things go on and as the, the years and the decades and the centuries pass and they do certain things, this will change. Some wraiths have the ability to sculpt themselves and or others into whatever appearances they desire. Not that you're aware of any of that at this point. Right now you're in a sort of delirium until a wraith that works as a reaper decides to free you from your call. Now this is only very rarely an act of kindness. Reapers are not interested in your freedom. They just want to sort of sell you into slavery. Because the Shadowlands are run by something called the Hierarchy, a, a great unforgiving bureaucracy of the dead that will slowly, over time, grind your soul to dust. The hierarchy is also known as the Empire of Stygia, or the Dark Kingdom of Iron. And it's not the only Dark Kingdom out there. The Dark Kingdoms of Jade, Obsidian, Ivory, they all exist for other parts of the world and they cater to their specific grand cultures. There's also the Dark Kingdom of Fire, which it is really inappropriate to make any sort of jokes about. But if you lived, laughed, and loved in the Western world, you are going to Stygia. That's just how it works. And honestly, being like put into uh, the hierarchy is kind of the best case scenario for you, because there are some Reapers, rather disreputable ones, but they do exist, who will just immediately throw you into the Soul Forges in order to manufacture tables and chairs and Furbies because that's the only way ghosts can actually make stuff in the underworld. So if you ever commit any particularly heinous crimes against the laws of the hierarchy, they might actually melt your soul down to make things with it. Which they claim destroys your consciousness. But I don't know if you've ever like seen a Furby, but something in there is very much disturbed and also in a great deal of pain. Now the purpose of the hierarchy is ostensibly to help the wraiths that make it up deal with their unresolved issues and aid them in the process of transcending. In practice, it does the literal exact opposite by, you know, fucking around with your fetters and manipulating your passions. Or having you try to resolve your issues by actually resolving them in the real world instead of, you know, getting over them. And also you're not allowed to do that either. It's a deeply dysfunctional organization ruled by an absentee emperor known as Charon. Not, you can say Karen, but it sounds sounds weird. And it has fallen to corruption long time ago. This is because all wraiths carry within them their shadow, which is an entity that's a sort of dark reflection of their darkest, deepest, innermost self-hatred. The goal of a shadow is to manipulate and sabotage all of the efforts that a wraith undertakes, and also all of the efforts that all of the collective wraiths undertake. In a sense, the shadow is analogous to the beast for vampires, except instead of being, you know, like a sociopathic, uh, self-preservation type predator being, it's uh, focused on the self-loathing, uh, destructive aspects of actual deep psychological manipulation. And it is, in many senses, much more formidable than the beast as an opponent to carry around in your head. There's even something analogous to being a white, which is like a, a, a mindless killer vampire that has fallen completely off the humanity track and is just only the beast now. For Wraiths, this is the Spectres, who are uh, not mindless at all. They are actually very intelligent. They've fallen completely to their shadows and are now dedicated to tearing down Stygia, the society of the undead, and destroying everything. The most effective method Spectres and Shadows have found to achieve this goal is to not simply destroy but corrupt everything that the Society of the Dead builds, no matter how well-meaning. And because every single member of the hierarchy, including absentee father Charon, has a shadow, inevitably this is what happens. Much like the psyche part of a wraith is powered by pathos, the shadow part of a wraith is powered by angst, 
which it can use in game mechanics terms to overwhelm the wraith in a moment of weakness and control its actions. Curiously, spectres have this the other way around, where the overwhelming part of them is now the shadow and not the psyche, but they still have that little slice of psyche that torments them with, like, a conscience and guilt and what have you, the way that the shadow did the other way around, which is... So cool. But this is why I like to call Wraith uh, a depression, the role-playing game. Because for a lot of people, just having this voice in the back of your head, trying to sabotage everything you do, making you do shit that really, it serves no other purpose but to destroy your own life and to make you feel bad, to reinforce this, like, internal monologue that is like you you are shit and you need to arrange the world in a way that makes you feel as shit as possible because that's what you deserve yeah that's how it works that's how depression works for a whole lot of people and here's the kicker the if you may have figured this out already but as a player you control the psyche part of your wraith and your shadow is controlled by another player at the table, and you also control someone else's shadow. This requires a lot of trust and, like, advanced role-playing skills, but it can make for a highly satisfying experience. And the reason Shadows and Spectres do all that is Oblivion. But to understand what Oblivion even is, we need to sort of conceptualize the geography of the underworld. Which can be a bit, like, complicated and counterintuitive because it doesn't really abide by the same physical laws, especially the rules of space, that our world does. Think of it as one of those bathtubs that are also a shower, which, I mean, they're made maybe all bathtub because you can put a shower head up to the thing. Now, the air above the surface of the water is the Shadowlands, which as a term is sometimes also used to refer to the entirety of the underworld, but technically it only describes the bit of it that is a dark and dreary reflection of the Skinlands. And reflection may not be the perfect term to describe it either, because the Shadowlands are built entirely out of memories, so the streets that you walk in the Shadowlands may not be entirely a analogous to the way that they look in the Skinlands. In terms of competing for memory space, which is not as much of a problem as you might think, things that exist currently have a distinct advantage because people tend to see them every day, so even if they only remember them unconsciously, they still remember them. So places mostly do look the way that they look today. However, sometimes things are destroyed, buildings are torn down or renovated to a significant extent, and the only thing that remains of them is their memory. They no longer have the benefit of being a physical structure that constantly reinforces that memory whenever it is perceived. So an iconic building that was demolished will probably still exist in the Shadowlands because people remember it, even if something else in the Skinlands has been built in its stead, in which case, often they may coexist in kind of, but sort of not really, the same spot. And these memories need not be current or entirely accurate either. Ancient wonders of the classical world, like the Colossus of Rhodes or the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, are still part of the Shadowlands today, because we have a pretty good idea of what they looked like, and a lot of people think about them and remember them. Just like the Twin Towers, the Palace of the Republic, and the Amber Room. Interestingly, if you were to destroy these things in the Shadowlands, which, mind you, is no easy feat, the memories of them in the Skinlands would begin to fade, much like if they were to fade in the Skinlands, they would start disappearing in the Shadowlands. So you can imagine that the geography, the physical structure of the Shadowlands is a bit warped, sort of like a, a homunculus type map that uh, sort of maps different areas of the brain to how we perceive with the senses. The eyes and the hands are not that big a part of the body, but they do take up a lot of real estate up in that noggin. The farther away you get from civilization, the more tenuous the geography of the Shadowlands becomes. There are still a few places on Earth where no human being has ever been, and there's a few more places where no living human being has ever been. Those places do not exist in a meaningful way in the Shadowlands, although some people will disagree with this assessment. So really the main important bit of the Shadowlands are the cities, which are also known as necropoli. Pretty much every city uh, that exists is also a necropolis in the Shadowlands, and kind of because there's sort of more cities that have 
disappeared that people still remember though they linger in the collective uh, subconscious of humanity uh, there's more necropoli than cities most necropoli in the western world are ruled by the hierarchy perhaps a little more tightly controlled than the way the camarilla rules the cities of the vampires but not by much. Remember, the hierarchy is a very corrupt and languid institution. And a lot of people in there are as hungry for power as others are happy to serve them. So the particular internal power structures, the rules and regulations, which legions are in charge of which area at any given time, it can be very different from city to city. Wraiths are drawn to the Shadowlands because they connect them to the world of the living. It is, in a metaphysical sense, the place where their fetters are located. A wraith with no fetters cannot survive in the Shadowlands for long. And that is because, like in any functioning shower, there's water coming from up top. Okay, so this is not like a, like a small shower head, but one of them, like, super high-tech, full coverage, mega blast, it, water comes from all directions type shower head and also it is constantly malfunctioning in unpredictable ways. That, my friends, is the Tempest and in a sense it obscures most of the Shadowlands. Outside of the Necropoli and the ever-changing byways that we use to navigate in between them, the Tempest rules and annihilates all. It used to be a lot more relaxed, but nowadays the Tempest is a vast stormy sea of pelting acid rains that is almost impossible to navigate. And just because our metaphors do not already uh, utilize enough non-Euclidean geometry, and just to drive home how much real geometry does not actually apply to the underworld, the Tempest suffuses the Shadowlands, but it also kind of exists underneath them. It sort of thickens the farther down you go, creating what is called the real, true Umbra, the thing that really separates the underworld from the world of the living. But not only is the Tempest in and of itself absolutely destructive and hazardous, it also contains a huge number of very dangerous and horrid creatures, not just spectres that like run around it and look for wraiths that they can tear apart, but also the category of being that wraiths call Huistimu. They are, to put it plainly, the sea monsters of the underworld. Giant moors that are invisible in the storm until they are right above you. Cerberus hounds that breathe green fire and giant krakens lurking underneath the surface. Not to mention like angels and demons and djinn. But much like uh, it spews horrors into the Shadowlands and the places below them, the Tempest also brings gifts. Especially after a particularly powerful weather event known as a maelstrom, a lot of stuff will be left behind, dredged up from the depths of human memory. And some of it can actually be pretty valuable. If nothing else, it can be used to make other stuff with it. Not in the deep manufacturing sense, because remember, everything here is actually made out of memories, but even though this beautiful Sonic the Hedgehog Funko Pop is not in fact made out of plastic. It will serve the same purpose if you put it up in your haunt to inform any potential visitors that you are a fucking virgin. And also, not all of the beings that hang out in the Tempest are necessarily malicious. It's just most of them. As we move down in our analogy, we come to the surface of the water, the place where the Tempest is actually the roughest. The actual, real, sunless sea. Not related to the game franchise. And floating on that sea, sort of like bubble rafts, or you know, them rubber duckies, are the Dark Kingdoms. You know how uh, on the in the oceans things fall like fall down as marine snow, it's called, it's detritus, and they sort of accumulate in mounds at the bottom of the ocean floor? Or if you make mead or wine or anything like that, uh, uh, how yeast particles will flocculate to the bottom of your fermentation vessel. This is kind of what happens to memories that are being forgotten in the Shadowlands as they drop 
through the Tempest. They create these islands, which are the Dark Kingdoms. Now, the main one for Wraith as a setting is obviously Stygia, the Dark Kingdom of Iron, but I do have to say that not all of the rafts that form, perhaps probably not even most of the rafts that form, are strictly speaking Dark Kingdoms. Some are also places called Far Shores, and their purpose is to basically be spiritual rehab centers to help Wraiths transcend. Though, of course, because of the corruption, that permeates the underworld, most of them are actually bullshit, and they're places of quack salvary where you will get forced into even worse slave labor, tortured, or maybe just deconstructed for spare parts. Why a lot of wraiths choose not to go to them, because it is not a roll of the dice that will be in your favor. The main thing we care about is Stygia, the greatest necropolis in the Dark Kingdom of Iron, and the seat of the hierarchy. Unlike other necropoli, Stygia is not a place that corresponds to any particular city that exists in the real world, but is instead made out of forgotten places and bits from things that have been remembered over the course of Western history. And if regular necropoli already didn't make sense a lot of the time, Stygia was constructed by city planners that were loaded on every type of mushroom that has existed since the Devonian period. That is to say, Stygia does not have city planners. It is absolutely gargantuan. Practically endless. Styles of architecture mix here like dill pickles, cheap chocolate, and desiccated lemon rinds. Art Deco skyscrapers loom over densely crowded Viking longhouses, facing ancient Greek temples squashed in the middle of tiny alleys from Victorian London. Standing above it all is the Onyx Tower, a great lighthouse built of pretty plain grey stone where Charon, the Emperor of Stygia, would be found if he was anywhere to be found, really. Also in Stygia, we find the headquarters of the legions and the guilds, which we're going to talk about in a minute. First, let's have a chat about the water. In our metaphor, everything that lies underneath the surface of the water is the labyrinth. If Stygia was kind of chaotic, the labyrinth is the place where meaning is actively destroyed. If the marine snow of lost memories and destroyed fragments of human consciousness could be ground down any further, any finer, it would sink even beneath the marine snow of the absolute ground and form this utterly senseless patchwork of bits and pieces of places that have been forgotten a long time ago. It's essentially a vast set of sort of infinite catacombs where the open freezers of fast food joints are open to medieval torture chambers where you can go down to the upper floor of a brutalist penthouse that looks out on a crystal cavern full of free-floating pyramids. And those are the really normal bits that make sense. At least in most most of the underworld, the laws of nature as people experience them still apply. You know, green is still green and down is still down. The labyrinth laughs at such concepts. This is a place where rivers, frozen solid, flow along like babbling brooks in spring. A place where roads made out of obsidian moan with pleasure when tread upon. And no one can even begin to make sense of it all because the labyrinth is always changing. The only speakable things that live down here are spectres. And there's a lot of unspeakable things here too. The farther down you go, the worse it gets. Until you get to the one place that is none place. The thing that the labyrinth and the rest of the underworld are inevitably and inexorably circling. The drain that the labyrinth is both blocking and being pulled down. Consumed by. Oblivion. This is it. Not just with a capital O, but written in all caps. The Oblivion. The forgetting, the annihilation of all meaning and all existence through the incessant grinding of entropy. The thing that all spectres serve, the thing that all shadows are trying to pull wraiths and their society down to. Oblivion isn't just the empty concept of nothingness. It is the uncaring nature of the process of annihilation. In a sense, it is kind of like a black hole where nothing that ever goes past its event horizon ever returns. Except, uh, you know, 
Uh, some things do return. Oblivion is not hateful or vindictive. It doesn't have, like, a personal gripe with existence, and that's why it is destroying it. It's happening because that is what Oblivion is. Now, in Vampires, the discipline of Oblivion is used to create uh, terrible supernatural shadows and also control ghosts. Grandmasters of this discipline can step down into the labyrinth to travel vast distances in the blink of an eye. They can cloak themselves in shadow so dark that not even the sun itself can penetrate it. Though those abilities are not really available even to player characters, as far as I'm aware. All vampires fear the dark power of the La Sombra for this reason, and they distrust the necromantic rituals of the Hikata. Like, seriously, the use of Oblivion in whatever presentation it comes makes even the most jaded Methuselah uncomfortable. Not that they, like, know these things in an academic sense, it's purely instinctive. Now, if the Oblivion discipline is a bell pepper, the Oblivion with all capital letters is a whole season's harvest of Trinidad Maruga Scorpions. The entire point of Wraith as a game is to not fall victim to it and instead sort of transcend your nature to get out of this damned purgatory. Many, if not most, fail to do so. And who knows? There are some that say that, really, Transcendence is Oblivion. Shouldn't be saying shit like that in the hierarchy, though, unless you're looking for a way to get Soul Forged into a dog collar. So it's a different day today. I don't record these all on the same day, but unfortunately I spilled something on the shirt that I was wearing yesterday. I'm also fairly recently out of the shower and freshly shaven, so I don't think I can deceive you about this fact this time around. But speaking of the hierarchy, let's talk about the legions. Your legion is kind of like your clan in Wraith, except being part of the hierarchy, it's a little more hierarchical. Basically, they all function like Clan Tremere, back when Clan Tremere functioned. You have a position, you work that position following the orders that are given to you by your superiors. And maybe every once in a while one of those superiors gets sucked into oblivion, so a post frees up. Every legion is governed by a Death Lord, which is a badass title. They're basically sort of state chancellors, viziers that were appointed by Charon before he, you know, fucked off again. And the purpose of them and their legions is to help the wraiths of Stygia transcend. Factually though, they are very corrupt and in constant bureaucratic and often like actual legitimate warfare type situations competition with each other for no particular reason. Pretty much the one rule that they all more or less agree on is the core tenet of the Stygian hierarchy, which is the dictum mortem. Now, the dictum mortem is not worded in any particular individual language because that would be a bit pointless, but essentially it boils down to do not fuck with the mortal world. There's a whole complicated code attached to it, and also everyone's constantly trying to get around it, up to and very much including the highest ranks of the hierarchy. The legions are, as the name would suggest, definitely military organizations, but they still manage to fight most of their conflicts through avenues of subterfuge and bureaucracy. Told you this game was about depression. They also all feature civilian positions, though the delineation of what is civilian and what is military is not always as clear, even though it generally should be, and those usually take care of all the infrastructure that the underworld relies on. But when wartime comes, some get to hide behind a desk, most don't really, even though maybe their combat position is still legally a civilian position, Again, a lot of fuckery and bureaucracy. There's eight legions in total, although one of them is kind of a special case for which most of the rules don't apply. And which one you join up with depends on your cause of death. And that's not always so clear cut, because for instance, if you die of Alzheimer's, that is a disease that you get in old age, but it also can make you quite mad. Usually local legion leaders in the Shadowlands are in competition with each other to try and find the most recruits 
in ambiguous cases. But if you are such an ambiguous case, uh, usually what's gonna happen is that you'll end up with the most powerful legion in that particular given area, unless they have somehow traded you for political favors. The only person that is never consulted in any of this is you, on account of it not mattering what you think. Do bear in mind that with the current Wraith Metaplot, the legions kind of don't exist anymore in the way that they used to, but really it's kind of the only material you have available, unless you sort of count Orpheus, which I kind of don't, personally. Though we are gonna talk about Orpheus at the end a little bit. Listen, nobody can tell you how you're supposed to run your World of Darkness game. The first Legion we're gonna talk about today is the Iron Legion, and it is the only one that probably has a significant plurality of all the other Legions agreeing that it's kind of the most important one. This is because the main purpose of the Iron Legion is to protect the high hierarchy from the ravages of the Tempest by making sure its infrastructure is always in tip-top shape. They make storm shelters, basically, and they do that a lot. If you find shelter somewhere from the predations of Oblivion, the Iron Legion was probably involved. The kinds of wraiths that are inducted into the Iron Legion are those who die of old age, which may raise a few eyebrows for you. Most people kinda die of old age, especially nowadays. Sure, there's a broad number of things that fall under the old age umbrella. You don't just get so old that you drop dead one day. That doesn't happen. There's always some kind of reason. And that sort of ambiguity does cost the Iron Legion a whole lot of recruits, certainly. But the main thing is that the longer people live, the less likely they are to be become wraiths after they die. Cause look, it's no secret that it's gonna happen to all of us. We are all eventually going to die. It's something people who die of old age tend to see coming somewhere down the line. So they have a lot of time to make their peace with it and also to take care of their unfinished business. If you die like beyond your sixth decade of existence, chances are you probably had ample time to at least give whatever you were trying to do a solid shot. You weren't really taken out of the world prematurely. Most people don't become wraiths anyway, and among the elderly, even fewer do. Nevertheless, the Iron Legion is still the largest of them all, but not by a significant margin. Their members can be identified by sort of dark bands of discoloration on their extremities, which represent the struggles and hardships that they had to contend with in life. The more of the bands you are, the more immediate respect you are given within the organization, though they do not in any way represent your actual rank. In terms of its culture and how different wraiths interact with each other, the Iron Legion is probably the most egalitarian of them all, and the reasons for this are very pragmatic. When you've lived a couple decades, you're not really willing to take shit from other people and let yourself be told what to do. Even freshly dead, you will have vast amounts of accumulated knowledge and experience, and the confidence in yourself to be able to tell when someone's being a fucking idiot and when you are right. Respect the elderly is very much reflected in the Iron Legion's attitudes. The leader of the Iron Legion is known as the Ashen Lady, who was a very long time ago a sort of queen of a Celtic tribe somewhere in Britain, probably the Canovi. But given that these lines, names, and demarcations were given by Roman scholars who hadn't even really met any of these cultures personally centuries after the fact, and also because there's a lot of contradictory information about every Death Lord out there, I would not necessarily take this as a definite fact. Her reputation is that of a gentle, even-tempered woman who practices the virtue of patience and likes to think things through before acting rashly. Among the Death Lords, she is often the diplomat and mediator, working ceaselessly for the stability of Stygia. All that being said, she is a formidable political operator, and once she has said her mind to something, it's, she's kind of unstoppable, because she's already considered every angle that you are thinking of right now. Also, apparently, she really likes the Fae, the fairies, but she hates vampires, which makes me wonder how she feels about the Chiasid bloodline. She rules from the Seat of Shadows, an almost demonstratively spindly collection of spires. And what it does is it looks like 
newly built in the morning like it was just erected and throughout the day it ages so it looks decrepit, almost like a ruin in the evening. It houses hundreds if not thousands of wraiths that enjoy the Ashen Lady's trust and hospitality. All the trust and hospitality of her many ministers and advisors that she keeps around in order to take advantage of their vast and varied perspective on all issues. The Iron Legion also includes a sort of experimental weather service. Basically they have like stations everywhere and they try to, through like wraith magic math science, predict where the tempest is going to be worst and when there's going to be like a major storm, a maelstrom, a huge and devastating weather event. The Skeletor Legion is the backbone of the Stygian bureaucratic apparatus comprising vast numbers of clerks, archivists and administrators. In short, they're kind of the civil servants of Stygia, which yes, does include cops. Their numbers tend to be either largely overestimated or underestimated depending on how much you deal with the paperwork aspect of being in the underworld, but they're definitely one of the largest. Their recruitment numbers have dwindled quite a bit though because the people who are predestined for the Skeletal Legion are those who die of disease. And especially in the West, disease has been dying. Because of the nature of disease and how many different ways it can manifest that are still like similar across all of the people who had it, there's a, a sort of diversity, if you will, within the Skeletal Legion that manifests in a lot of factionalism. Look, people who died of cholera just relate to other people who died of cholera more than to people who died of smallpox. Many of these diseases also leave quite a lot of scarring, like they, they change you a lot as you die and in the moment of death so they leave scarring on your corpus as well. So it's also often pretty easy to identify what particularly took you down. Something else that many of us unfortunately are painfully aware of is that disease often comes in waves like epidemics and pandemics and so on. So they create these natural cohorts within the Legion that often become somewhat exclusive political clubs. And in this, various types of disease are constantly vying for each other over trendiness status. You can see cultural shifts over the centuries where the popularity of particular diseases waxes and wanes. The death lord that rules the Skeletal Legion is, you better, you better be sitting Sitting down for this one. The Skeletal Lord. Or you know, Mr. Bony Hands, if you are currently talking about him behind his back and are very certain that he cannot hear you. He's pretty ancient, definitely very, very insane, probably some sort of record keeper during the Canaanite period, back when like monotheism was first emerging and Judaism was beginning to form. His existence is kind of an ironic paradox because with the job that his legion has and what he himself represents, you would expect him to be a sort of bone dry bureaucrat like most of the people in his legion. But in fact, the Skeletal Lord is a deeply spontaneous and creative person who's constantly implementing implementing new ideas, new plans, rearranging the bureaucratic structure of his people. He naturally has a deep personal fascination with disease, which in him manifests in the fact that he is really convinced that he is the actual biblical incarnation of pestilence. And also that he has branches of his organization essentially researching every single disease that has ever existed, and a lot of them that could potentially at some point exist. Which in the Shadowlands is kind of difficult because again, everything is only made out of memory, so it's a lot about like watching advances made in the Skinlands and keeping records of them, which luckily the Skeletal Legion is good at. At. And given the way that he gains his recruits, you would expect that he would be very interested in creating new and terrible diseases that kill a lot of people. And he does in fact do that. He, there's a lot of fucked up shit that only exists in the Shadowlands. But the only reason he hasn't released any of it into the Skinlands, probably, I mean, who knows where this and that pandemic came from, uh, it's because Charon told him not to do it. And if there's one thing the Skeletal Lord is even more than insane, it's loyal to his emperor. So much so that he has, like, scribes recording every single word that he has said and assembles these vast reports 
about everything that happens in Stygia. You know, so when Charon returns the next time, he can be updated on the minutiae of literally every single stray thought the Skeletal Lord has had ever since Charon left, however many centuries and thousands of years ago that was at any point. He rules from the Seat of Dust, which is perhaps a little bit of a misnomer because you would assume that it, it would be like very brittle and ground down. And to a certain extent it does look that way, it's a kind of a, a thin palace decorated with uh, lattice work and elaborate ornamentation. But it's also as close to indestructible as you can build in the underworld. It's made out of a special secret type of soul-forged bone alloy that is basically immune to wear and tear and can withstand un fathomable amounts of force. And in a surprisingly martial move, it is strictly a place of business. Kind of a bone-naked facts-only type situation. A really cool fact about the Skeletal Legion is that though its military branch is sort of meager, it does include the finest archery division in the underworld. Cause you got to have them skeleton archers in it. An almost inverse approach to the Skeletal Legion's civilian branch forward structure is the Grim Legion, which is pretty much much all about its military operations. They are the armed forces of the hierarchy. The army, navy, air force, space force, I guess. Waging war to pacify Necropoli and fight against renegades and heretics. As well as some of the largest scale threats that the Tempest sometimes sort of drops on the Dark Kingdom of Iron. They are best suited for this because the kind of people who join the Grim Legion are those who were killed by someone else. They are victims of violence. And the most frequent victims of violence are, and always have been, warriors. As a result, the ranks of the Grim Legion are filled to a significant extent with seasoned soldiers who have died in battle. They are disciplined and they know how to fight. They're motivated by the fact that their Death Lord kind of promises each and every one of them personally that he will help them find whoever killed them and exact their revenge upon them. Which is, of course, very explicitly against the Dictum Mortem because, you know, the people who tend to have killed them tend to still be alive, and when they do die, there's really no guarantee that they will become wraiths, so the time to act is rather quickly. And whenever that does happen, they have a special division of Reapers looking specifically for the calls of people in the Shadowlands that members of the Legion might want to take revenge on. Something very true about the Grim Legion is that it enjoys quite a bit of infighting and backstabbing. The fact that a lot of bandits and gangsters are part of this Legion whose sort of violent lives eventually caught up with them, and also they're often the kind of people that others want to take revenge on. It doesn't help, really. Members of the Grim Legion are pretty easy to identify because getting fucking killed tends to leave its mark on a person. So the appearance of its legionnaires is in fact often quite grim. The Death Lord in charge of the Grim Legion is known as the Smiling Lord, and to be entirely honest with you, I'm not really sure what the fuck he has to smile about because his position is a pretty precarious one. Depending on who you ask, he was a crusading knight of the Teutonic Order, a poor Portuguese Navy Admiral, or a random Ottoman patrolman who died trying to keep the Silk Road safe from bandits. And it may be all three of those things, because the only thing everyone knows for certain is that the guy who calls himself the Smiling Lord right now isn't the guy who originally called himself the Smiling Lord, if you catch my drift. And with all the infighting that goes on over there, who fucking knows how many times the guy's been replaced without anyone noticing? Remember that the corpus of a wraith can be altered extensively. Not to mention, all the Death Lords traditionally wear masks anyway. The Smiling Lord even broke the hierarchy itself once not so long ago. He took control of the Onyx Tower and declared himself Emperor of Stygia. It was so bad that Charon himself showed up to dethrone him and put him back in his place. Although whether or not that is the same person is once again anyone's guess. He is distrusted by all the other Death Lords because he has repeatedly demonstrated that he is a massive cunt. You may know that during the 20th century, there was this very bad thing that happened called the Holocaust, where 11 million people were murdered. That would have been a whole lot of wraiths in his ranks. But the Smiling Lord realized that not only would this overwhelm his legion's bureaucracy, 
It would also fill his ranks mostly with people who were like regular folks, not warriors. So they weren't really all that useful to him. What was supposed to happen, what the Death Lords kind of agreed on at first, is that they would split up the victims of the Holocaust evenly and like distribute them among their legions. Still would have meant a lot of useless people to him, and he also kind of didn't want them ending up anywhere else. So he used all of his influence to make sure that people who died in the Holocaust would not be able to enter the Dark Kingdom of Ayn at all. Which is how we get the Dark Kingdom of Wyre, the utterly horrid example of the cruel indifference of the Stygian bureaucracy. The Iron Legion is ruled from the Seat of Burning Water, which is primarily named after and most known for its iconic throne room, where there's the throne and there's like a moat of burning water around it. Except that water isn't actually water, but sort of like a special mixture that includes souls. You know when you have a fire, right, and the wood in it is still sort of humid? As the pockets of water in that log sort of heat up and expand, they will often outgas, making this really high-pitched wail. It kind of sounds like that, except it's the agonized cries of liquefied wraiths being burned a death. Ironically, this may be one of the Smiling Lord's very few redeeming qualities, because the people who tend to be burning in that pit are murderers that were successfully accused by their victims. Because a lot of murderers, and especially like serial killers, they eventually get executed. They die as victims of violence, so they end up in the Grim Legion, and it may happen to you that you will be serving alongside someone that, like, serial killed you. And because of the promise that is made to every wraith as it is inducted into the Legion, a lot of those murderers end up in the moat. But to temper whatever shred of sympathy you may potentially feel for this individual at this point in time, uh, he also kind of just throws people in there he doesn't consider to be particularly useful, so, you know. Another place where Killer and Killy might find themselves awkwardly passing each other in the hallways is the Penitent Legion. And what exactly the purpose of this Legion is, I gotta be honest with you, it's not entirely clear. They do a little bit of everything, but often in a very weird, experimental, idiosyncratic way. And also very far away from the other legions, if those other legions have any sort of say in it. Because those who enter the Penitent Legion are victims of madness. And while this does include a lot of people who were killed on purpose or by accident by the mentally ill, really the main group of people that the mentally ill are a danger to are themselves. The reason they're known as penitents is because it is a belief among Western Wraiths that oblivion is caused by the madness of living people who were not, in the traditional sense, sane. So they're kind of doing penance for having contributed to the power of oblivion during their lifetime. Which, you know, there's a lot of different opinions on whether or not this is true. And the Penitent Legion does in fact interact with the Labyrinth and Oblivion itself quite a lot. Of all the legions, their scouts are pretty much the best at navigating it, and some of their more formidable soldier squads are just as skilled at fighting spectres as the elite troops of the Iron Legion. That being said, because of their inherent instability and their closeness to Oblivion as such in their daily operations, many penitents do end up eventually becoming spectres themselves. They're marked by the fact that they display sort of blood stains coming out of their eyes, mouth, nose, ears, just random parts of their body, blotches on their skin. And most other wraiths kind of stay away from the penitents that are, you know, obviously identifiable because they're afraid that the touch of oblivion that they allegedly carry will rub off on them. The leader of this legion is the Laughing Lady, which is called this because her laughter slash weeping, it's really not always entirely clear what it is, sort of suffuses the entirety of her palace, which she also never leaves. Very few senior members of the Legion even get to meet her at all, and they all have their own agendas, so a lot of different stories on what she actually looks like. The most popular of those is, by the way, that she is a child. She even sends envoys to the rare meetings of, like, the Council of Death Lords, which the other Death Lords are not particularly happy about. This 
made it very easy for the Smiling Lord to sort of invade her palace and by force and subterfuge install a sort of fake laughing lady. She herself proved impossible to find in those halls though, because she fucked off into the labyrinth where she came back from eventually with Carol. She was able to do this because her palace, the Seat of Sucker... No, hang on, look, I- listen, I know it's- that's not- that's the correct pronunciation of it. I'm not calling it this. I'm calling it the Seat of Succor because it- it doesn't sound terrible. It isn't just in and of itself an ever-shifting labyrinth which made it a bit difficult for the attacking troops to sort of make their way in there. It also most definitely has a bunch of doors and hatches that lead directly to the capital L labyrinth. The palace itself is actually not all that particularly ostentatious. Though what exactly it looks like depends on your perspective and who you are. It's always rather like simple, subdued, most often a sort of hospital type facility. The interior is always open to all, although not all that many wraiths actually go there, even though they do offer free clinical services, which can be very valuable on account of all the horrid laughter that suffuses the palace. And the deeper you go, the more crazy and illogical it becomes. Only the penitents can actually navigate it with any sort of safety, and even they find themselves on the run from nightmares from time to time. All this did not, however, protect the palace from being overrun by the Grim Legion. Though they are of course not the main armed forces of the Stygian hierarchy, they are certainly more like its, its special forces in the sense that there's a situation where strategically it requires rather an unorthodox approach. They have hellhounds and sort of giant uh, elephant war machines and even living tanks. Well, you know, dead tanks, but all of those are made of particularly insane wraiths. A lot of the most fucked up creatures that crawl out of oblivion are not in fact original creations, but abominations created by the Penitent Legion that eventually fell to their shadows. Few wraiths shiver when they hear the words Emerald Legion. In fact, many of them probably do whatever the ghost equivalent is of a breathing a gasp of relief because it turns out the Emerald Legion is actually, get this, kinda nice. Not just nice to deal with, which is explicitly one of their core values, but also like kinda warm and welcoming. Their job is to run the business and non-government ventures of the Stygian hierarchy, and for this purpose they actually encourage a strong culture of dissent and freedom for the purpose of innovation. In some ways this is by necessity. The wraiths destined to join the Emerald Legion are those who die because of accidents. This makes them one of the smaller legions even though people who die by accident are much more likely to become wraiths than pretty much any other group. Not only does this include a vast array of people with very different worldviews, it also tends to be a lot of people who have never even taken a single step toward making peace with death. The only thing they are all very exhaustively taught are the Emerald Values, which place a lot of worth on out-of-the-box thinking and also compassion toward your fellow wraiths, though that one is not as highly on the list as the other. Members of the Emerald Legion are encouraged to come up with their own ideas regarding pretty much every aspect of Stygian society. And if they strike out to implement those ideas, they can count on the Legion's support. They have a very strong aversion toward the practice of soul-forging wraiths into various different objects, so they try to avoid it. But they're also pragmatic enough to do it in the most extreme of cases. Even wraiths that are considered irredeemable are supposedly better off as slaves. Now you might be thinking, hang on, if these wraiths died by accident and your corpus looks like the way that it looked like in the moment of your death, a lot of these should be really fucked up. Which, uh, yeah, that is definitely true and accurate. However, as a saving grace, a lot of people who die in freak accidents are actually dead in the loosest definition of that term, long before most of the actual damage is done to their physical body. So the corpses of those wraiths look like what they looked like at the moment that they actually died, as opposed to the moment when they had already been dead. That still leaves a lot of fucked up people though, it really does. Perhaps nowhere else is it very fortunate 
fortunate that the corpus can be altered. The man who leads the Emerald Legion is known as the Emerald Lord, who is very definitely not the same guy as the original one. During the brief period in which the Smiling Lord actually ruled over the land after his takeover, the Emerald Lord from very early on actually supported him and his Grim Legion. That guy, by the way, was a particularly opportunistic member, a political operator of the uh, Roman Senate in the early days of the Republic. But the second things went poorly for the Smiling Lord and his Grim Legion, the Emerald Lord switched sides again. When Charon came back, he just pretended like he had been loyal to his Emperor all along, which it didn't really take a genius to figure out that that wasn't the case. Charon didn't even need to peruse the records kept by the Skeletal Lord in order to be kept in the loop about that shit. So nobody really knows what happened to the original Emerald Lord, it's just that one day a new guy showed up with all of the right credentials, all of the right keys to the office, the mask, and everything new to say all the correct things. This was not a clandestine replacement. This was very clearly and obviously a different guy. They really wanted the members of the Emerald Legion to know that their boss had been got. Rumor has it the new Emerald Lord is actually a guy called Governor Morris, who actually was one of the founding fathers of the United States, and he died because he stuck a whalebone up his ass. To clear his colon, okay? That's why he did it. He's actually a pretty based guy. In real life, he wrote the uh, preamble to the Constitution and was one of the founding fathers very vehemently opposed to slavery. But really, honestly, it could be anyone. This is just the story that I personally prefer. Do not take this at, like, face value. His palace is known as the Seat of Thorns. I bet you'd expect me to say emeralds, but it's not emeralds, it's actually it's the seed of thorns. It is extremely green though, it's this glorious shining palace studded with sort of these green lamps that you should not touch because they will fuck you up. There are a lot of like vines that very thickly surround the palace and they have some sort of rudimentary intelligence and they have thorns and they will protect the palace. Fun fact, in contrast to this culture of like constant innovation and coming up with new ways of doing stuff, one of the jobs that the Emerald Legion was actually given specifically by Charon is the very rigid and boring and like strictly adhere to the correct protocol task of watching the Venus Stair, which is like a big stairwell in the middle of Stygia that leads down to the Labyrinth. And you know, given that not everyone who dies of an accident is like super flexible and adaptable and a ready-made innovator, the Emerald Legion manages to give purpose to even the most obstinate members of society. The smallest of the regular legions, the Silent Legion is one of extremes, featuring both some of the most elite and effective warriors whose attacks penetrate deep into the heart of oblivion, and also, you might say, therapists even, counselors, to the rest of the Legion's most scarred wraiths. They find themselves in a constant political struggle to justify their own existence, and the reason for this is that both the Penitent and the Grim Legion lay claim to all of the dead of the Silent Legion for very different reasons. This is because people who are inducted into the Silent Legion are people who have died of suicide. The Grim Legion contends that this is a form of violent death. They were victims of violence, even if that violence came from themselves. And the Penitent Legion claims that one must be mad to choose suicide, so obviously they should get all those wraiths. And some who carry the very distinct gloomy aura that says this should be a member of the Silent Legion do end up with one of the other two if they are the predominant political power in their respective necropoli. And you might be thinking, why do victims of suicide become wraiths at all? I, I, they chose to die. Haven't they made peace with death? Isn't that kind of the whole idea of it? Well, I, yeah, but like actually very much no. People almost never commit suicide because they feel like they've dealt with all of life's challenges and now they feel ready to move on. They do it because they just find it too difficult to be alive. Either that, or it's because they're Canadians, 
and they're being pushed into assisted suicide because they are poor and they can no longer help maintain the profit margins of capitalist business magnates. Really, really cool and based to force people to fucking die to avoid homelessness. It's not like we could provide housing even though there is a vastly outsized amount of housing available to people. No, that would take away the ability of landlords to use the threat of homelessness to make people pay more rent so they can pay off the mortgages of the properties that they own because they're rich. And a lot of the people who choose a method of suicide where there's like a delay between the point where you seal your fate and the point where you actually die, like people who jump from bridges for instance, they realize in that incredibly short time span that they actually, they kind of don't want to die. It's a very common occurrence if you ask a lot of suicide survivors that specifically fell off bridges and stuff like that. It's a, it's a common thing. But for most of them it's too late, they've already made the choice. The Silent Legion also includes all manner of martyrs who made like great self-sacrificial deaths. So heroes who gave up their seats on the lifeboats, uh, political activists who took their hunger strikes a little too far, and other types of terminally altruistic people aplenty. And finally, also a lot of people who just led terrible lives and they felt miserable pretty much all of the time, they also end up here. And you could very validly argue that, uh, you know, drinking yourself to death by ways of years of alcoholism is also a kind of suicide. One key fact to understand about the Silent Legion is that among all of the legions, the wraiths in it either fall to oblivion, aka commit suicide numero dos, or reach transcendence faster than the wraiths of any other legion. This makes sense if you think about it for a second, because like a depressed alive person is probably gonna make for a depressed ghost. And a lot of those great martyrs, they get to look back on a legacy they left behind in the Skinlands of the people who survived because of them, the people who consider their sacrifice to have been worthwhile, speaking of them in the highest terms. And a lot of wraiths in the Silent Legion that, you know, they don't reach transcendence, but they still kill themselves, they are inspired by these martyrs, but they just can't bring themselves to work through their issues and achieve happiness, so they just go out against Oblivion kamikaze style. The leader of the Silent Legion is known as the Quiet Lord, which also a lot of the wraiths in the Silent Legion are known as quiets as opposed to silence, because silence is all sounds like a different- it's very confusing, but such is life, I mean death. And really, pretty much nothing is known about him except that he's some guy. Many say he's a Greek philosopher. Either Cleantes of Assos or Zeno of Kittium. Others say he's a Slavic shaman who offered himself up to a Germanic bandit warlord for some reason to like have his tribe spared. Even others say that he was an impoverished Egyptian alcoholic who followed his wife into suicide. The Choir Lord never talks about himself. Ever. In fact, as the name would suggest, it is rather rare that the Quiet Lord speaks at all. If he does, it's to a fellow Death Lord, or to give encouraging advice to members of his Legion, which he seems to genuinely care for. To the extent where he basically does not really enforce the Dictum Mortum all too strictly, even quietly, get it, cause he's the Quiet Lord, encouraging members of his legion to actually go out there and take care of their business in the Skinlands. A lot of Silent Legion wraiths actually spend a significant amount of their time preventing suicides in the Skinlands, which is not only a blatant violation of the Dictum Mortem, it also directly diminishes the numbers of the Silent Legion. Quiet Lord does not care. He rules from the Seat of Silence, which is a very clean and simple complex that reminds many modern wraiths of brutalist architecture. It's extremely gloomy and just hella desolate, even if it's full of people. Not to mention it's eerily quiet, not even in its big halls where you should be able to hear echoes, will you hear any sort of echo. And it's just, it's such a funny but also very morbid thing, so I need to mention this. There's a certain particular type of wraith in the Silent Legion called an Angel of Angst, and uh, they're teenagers. They're teenagers who committed suicide, 
And even in the Suicide Legion, most other wraiths consider it to be just a phase. And that's often true. Like, a lot of the most productive and compassionate members of the Silent Legion originally started out as Angels of Angst. The Legion of Paupers is special in many ways. Some say that it is the largest legion of them all, which is obviously dross and said in like a satirical, political, hyperbole type context. Although it does make a certain amount of sense, their practical purpose in Stygian society is to act as sleuths and detectives getting to the bottom of all manner of unexplained mysteries and phenomena, which there's a lot of in the underworld. And these are never the big questions, like, what even is Oblivion, actually? Like, seriously, what the fuck is it? They're more like homicide detectives. This also, of course, predestines them to being spies and information brokers, among other reasons. Because the real, actual, main purpose of the existence of the paupers is to be a place where all of the wraiths nobody else wants can go. As I said before, there's often a lot of ambiguity as to where any particular wraiths actually belong, and the legions often squabble very desperately over them. Sometimes one is willing to trade them away to the other. Other times, they simply can find no compromise. Or sometimes, like, nobody wants them. Nobody tries to claim them, even in cases where very clearly they would belong in a particular legion. Whenever any of these scenarios happen, the wraith is given to the legion of paupers. But it isn't just the miscellaneous garbage category that ends up here, at least not on paper. Any wraiths whose deaths are shrouded in mystery, which actually happens a lot more often than you might think, they end up here also. Though death tends to leave very clear marks on wraiths, and most wraiths actually kind of remember what happened, there are situations where that just isn't the case. And discovering the manner in which they died, given that it's a, a pretty important point in their life, actually becomes a major quest of these wraiths, which is why they're perfect for the paupers. They are perhaps even less hierarchical than the Iron Legion, in like, even like a structural sense, they do not have a very clear hierarchy. You are expected to sort of follow the orders of the people who are kind of considered your superiors, and you're supposed to investigate the things that you're supposed to investigate, but outside of that, you get to be whoever you want to be. Even if someone is of a clearly higher rank than you, there's no, like, honorifics and titles and whatever the fuck. It's just a sort of dismal camaraderie among the paupers. And first among them is the beggar lord, who, ironically, doesn't even actually beg that much. He just takes whatever he's given. In a sense, it is actually he who gets begged, because on the Council of Death Lords, he tends to be the swing vote, which as a habitually underestimated political operator is a position he is well suited for. He doesn't even need to fight for the continued existence of his legion, he just gets the scrap from the other ones all the time. He doesn't even like his job all that much, he doesn't want to have the position that he has. And the only reason he's even in there in the first place is because he was a personal mate of Charon, probably even during his lifetime, which would make him Mycenaean. Some claim he was an actual beggar in real life, which is why he has that name. He is tired of existence in general, and the only reason he has not ended it by now by flinging himself into oblivion is because he is a self-described coward. Although how much of that is like an act? Who knows? His palace is the seat of golden tears, a, a construct clobbered together without like particular style or design ideas in mind. No, like this is where you go through the corridor. It's all just whatever pieces there are, put them in there. Who gives a shit? It's kind of a reflection of Stygia itself in a way. And you kind of, I'm sometimes not really sure where the palace ends and the rest of the city begins. The only thing everyone agrees upon when it comes to the Seat of Golden Tears is that it fucking sucks. Both aesthetically and as a home for wraiths. Nobody really knows their way around, the internal infrastructure is just not fit for purpose, and quite frankly, the place is fucking ugly, fam. People disappear in this palace all the time, and everybody kinda knows that they eventually come back as like filing cabinets and fountain pens. Wraiths of the paupers get sent to the soul forges all the time, it's what fills the beggar lord's coffers. He stopped caring about his people a long time ago. If you value your freedom, 
the Legion of Paupers is a good place for you, but at the same time, it also comes with all of the costs that freedom has. And finally, we have the most special legion of them all, the Legion of Fate. This legion does not operate the way any of the others do. Their purpose is much more of an executive one, guarding the existence of the Stygian hierarchy itself. They're a tiny elite group of wraiths who only really spring into action when the existence of the Empire itself is at stake. No particular kind of death marks one as a member of the Legion of Fate. It just happens that some people who die, their death marks are particularly bright, luminous, fulminant even, and many of them also have like symbols of infinity and determinism like dice all over their bodies. These dead belong to the fates, and nobody contests this, even though a lot of people don't like it. The only thing some of these wraiths have in common is that they shaped human history by being at the right place at the right time. Small things that they did had a huge impact on the world. This is by no means true of all of them. Many actually led rather unremarkable lives, although, you know, who knows what kind of ripples of causality these unremarkable lives had through the butterfly effect. The fates do. They know. They, they know this. They have this information. Yes, it's fates plural, and it's- they're not THE fate, which is confusing, so let me explain. In the underworld, there is an entity called the Lady of Fate, which is sort of a goddess, if you want, and nobody actually knows what exactly she is. A few say that she's actually just a wraith, which many consider to be rather blasphemous. Others say she is Eve, the mother of Cain. And even others say that she is an immensely powerful Euthanatos mage who has just sort of broken the concept of entropy itself. But most people think she's something else entirely, which, you know, quite frankly, Probably, yeah. She helped Charon on many of his heroic exploits, and it is by her grace that he is the Emperor of Stygia. She is related to, but definitely not one of, the Ladies of Fate, which are... I, to be honest, I couldn't tell you that either. They are an undefined number of mentally linked up entities that are perfect copies of each other, and presumably also the Lady of Fate. Nobody's seen her in quite some time either. Nobody knows exactly how many of them there are, but they all together jointly hold the title of Death Lord of the Legion of Fate. Even members of the Legion of Fate only see the Ladies of Fate very, very rarely, and this is considering they all live on the same compound, on like an island, in the middle of fucking nowhere. Yeah, the Seat of Fate is not just not located within Stygia, it's also, like, actually pretty fucking far away. Weird fact, though, trees grow here. That's a thing. This... Nowhere else in the underworld does that happen, at least as far as Western Wraiths are concerned. And it's an immensely valuable resource. There is a lot more to say about the Legion of Fate, but quite frankly, that is a level of Wraith Deep Lore that it's really counterproductive to get into here today. You're not gonna play a Legion of Fate member as a player character, most likely, and if you do, your GM will know a lot about the lore of Wraith already. And they pretty much never interact with the skin lands at all, unless it's for very specific regions, in which case the GM will probably, of whatever Chronicle, also know a lot about Wraith lore. Let's instead talk about the guilds. And what I really mean when I say the guilds is the Arkanoi. It's just that the two concepts are inextricably linked. Arkanoi are the disciplines of Wraith the Oblivion. They are supernatural powers that ghosts possess because they are ghosts. There are 16 Arkanoi in total, and though Wraiths may have certain predispositions, for some of them, a talent to be adept at one of them, or several in particular. There's no such thing as in-clan or out-of-clan Arkanoi. Any wraith can learn any Arcanos. Not to mention, many don't learn any of them because they find other ways of being useful in Stygian society. All legions have practitioners of all the Arkanoi within their ranks, but of course because the legions are structured differently, they have different interests, different tasks, the numbers vary. Frequent use of any Arcanoi 
volcanoes will over time leave its mark on the corpus of the wraith, and this mark cannot be removed. Some of them are more problematic than others. Each Arcanos has an associated guild, which any practitioner may or may not be a member of, but it's always kind of beneficial to be a member of that guild because it stores huge amounts of secrets and techniques and resources deep within its organizational vaults. These guilds are ancient, venerable institutions, some of which predate even the existence of the Stygian Empire itself and the rule of Charon. Having essential monopolies on particular crafts, they have an enormous amount of political influence. Except, of course, it's really not that simple because uh, the guilds don't actually exist. And I don't mean this in the this is fiction type sense because Wraith is an imaginary role playing game someone came up with. I mean this in the nudge nudge wink wink kind of way. Okay, so here's what happened, right? Basically in the late medieval period, the guilds managed to put aside all their fighting and squabbling that they were constantly engaged in in their monopolist competition to form a sort of trade federation, a, a Hanseatic League of the Underworld, if you will. And then they decided to use their complete control over every relevant aspect of the industrial economy to do a sort of coup. Yeah, this kind of thing kind of happens a lot in the Underworld. They wanted a council of guilds to rule the Stygian hierarchy, with Charon or, you know, whoever, as a sort of figurehead emperor to lend them some sort of legitimacy. The legions in particular were supposed to serve them directly instead of that figurehead emperor. And then Charon and the Death Lords were like, Nah, bro, fuck that. Y'all are dissolved. For real, for real, no cap. Yeah, look, people just talked differently back then. It, it was the medieval times. There was a little bit of turmoil, you might say, but in the end, it worked. The guilds were officially destroyed and no longer existed as legal entities with any sort of political standing. What remained was vast networks of practitioners of these individual Arkanoi who shared pre-established networks of contacts and supply lines. They had certain pre-existing business arrangements to honor and also control of certain repositories of knowledge. So essentially, the guilds just continued operating, but they only existed unofficially. And of course, their monopolies were immediately weakened and nowadays are really not firm at all. But the Dark Kingdom of Iron cannot exist without practitioners of these Arkanoi. And the practitioners of these Arkanoi just work better when they work together. The names of these guilds are inextricably linked with the respective Arkanoi that they represent, and even today any practitioner of a given Arkanos is referred to by others by the name of the guild that used to have the monopoly over that Arkanos. Doesn't matter whether they're actually a guild member, because again, and the guilds are not a thing. And the very definitions of what is and what isn't an Arcanos are fuzzy in and of themselves. Many have sub-disciplines that some argue should be Arcanoi in their own right, and some of those are, whereas others have overlaps where some people argue that they should be the same Arcanos, actually. They're social constructs, is what I'm trying to say. There are even evil Arcanoi outside of the 16 that we're going to talk about today, and they are practiced by specters instead of wraiths, although wraiths can also learn those. Today, the guilds, and thus everyone who practices these given individual Arcanoi, exist in a sort of tiered legal system. All guilds are officially banned, but some of them are more banned than others. The less banned ones are necessary for Stygia to function, and the more banned ones tend to be blatant violations of the Dictum Mortem. AKA the more banned ones are the ones more likely to interact with the world of the living. So yeah, if you had a, a vampire game and you interacted with a wraith that used, like, ghostly powers, there was an inherently rogue element to them. Most wraiths fear the hierarchy too much to even acquire these abilities. We start with what are known as the High Guilds, which are essential for the continuing operation of the infrastructure of the Stygian Hierarchy, and which are respected enough to pretty much operate out in the open and be valued and directly worked with 
by the legions. Inhabit is the arcanos that allows a wraith to, well, you know, inhabit an otherwise inanimate object. If that inanimate object is built for a purpose, they may even be able to use it to do the things that it is designed to do. Or you know, not designed to do if you're very powerful. The primary targets of inhabit are machines of all sorts, from cars to printing presses. But many of the most useful applications actually lie with computers and the navigation of cyberspace. Yes, Wraiths can get into your computer and hack you. A wraith can do pretty much anything a mortal hacker can do, except they can also sort of like physically enter the internet and travel along the lines of the internet because it's all connected, just like they can do with power lines. Which, to be fair, is kind of fucking dangerous. Practitioners of Inhabit are known as artificers, and you might very rightly ask yourself why they're considered a high guild if the entire purpose of their power is to interact with the skin land. Well, Inhabit is really an offshoot from the thing that the Guild of Artificers really does, the thing that gives them their economic power base, and which is perhaps the most important craft. Scratch that, it's definitely the most important craft in the underworld. Soul forging. The process of transforming plasmic objects, including wraiths, into different kinds of plasmic objects. The secrets of Inhabit were discovered by the ancient wraith Nuhudri, who you might think, given that he literally controls the most essential industry to the Stygian underworld, might be able to crown himself emperor. It's just that Nuhudri has never really been a particularly ambitious man, and also untold eons ago, Charon rescued him from certain oblivion in the labyrinth, so he's always been a very strong supporter of the Emperor's reign, if for no other reason, perhaps, than just gratitude. Frequent use of Inhabit eventually manifests as carrying symbols on your body that are also carried by the kinds of devices that you inhabit. Which, yes, does in fact mean that there are wraiths with Apple logos on their bodies running around. Moliate is the Arcanos that allows practitioners to alter the corpus of wraiths, whether it be their own or other wraiths with or without their consent. You can think of it a little bit like vicissitude, except vicissitude is a caveman smashing rocks together to create a hand axe, and Moliate is Michelangelo with a laser printer. Because the corpus of wraiths is so malleable, Moliate can easily make their skin be made out of steel, give them mighty wings that they can use to fly, reshape faces and bodies on a whim, and when they're powerful enough, just shapeshift into any shape imaginable. Physics are not an obstacle. Of course, one of the simplest applications of Merliate is to alter your own appearance, which can be done very, very quickly. So it's very popular with spies. Practitioners of Merliate are known as maskers for that exact reason. But of course, the guild at large basically sells its services as cosmetic surgery, and that's what a lot of people go to them for. And of course, while visiting the salon, you know, small talk happens and one might inquire as to some of the rumors that one might want to learn more information about, or, you know, just talk how one wishes that a certain other wraith might be disgraced in some manner. And hey, some people, they it just, they just leave big tips. That's what they do, they're generous people, and you go the extra mile for them. Frequent use of Merliate will eventually lead to the discovery of a particular aspect of their own appearance that even the greatest masters of the Arcanos cannot change about themselves no matter how hard they try. Which characteristic that is, is different for every wraith. This does allow them to be identified by an extremely good detective, but a lot of maskers have some very clever solutions for this problem. Castigate is the Arcanos that allows practitioners to keep their own shadow and the shadow of other wraiths in check. The methods utilized for this are numerous, ranging from talk therapy to physical ordeals. But in the end, they all serve the purpose purpose of weakening someone's shadow and strengthening their psyche. The powers of Castigate also work very well against Spectres, who are, you know, mostly shadow. So a lot of practitioners of the art also fight on the front lines against Oblivion. Remember that Wraith is a setting where ideas, memories, and emotions manifest physically. So the process of fighting with someone's shadow is 
physical. Practitioners of Castigate are known as pardoners because they pardon you from the sins of your shadow. And being essentially the psychotherapists of the underworld, they are in enormous demand. Every single wraith has a shadow, and beating that shadow back is what makes the hierarchy function. It is a huge part of everyone's existence. So it should be obvious why having people with these kinds of shadow banishing powers would be useful. And though they have access to a lot of the secrets and darkest thoughts and like actual weaknesses of a lot of the most powerful wraiths that exist in the world, the guild is pretty harsh with anyone who lets shit slip. Which is of course made easier by the fact that pardoners are able to have greater control over their own shadow, so their corrupting influence isn't as strong. Frequent use of castigate will eventually turn the practitioner's fingers black because they're constantly touching the darkness of oblivion. Usury is the arcanos that allows practitioners to manipulate the raw emotional energy of pathos. Giving it, taking it away, transferring it somewhere else, and even changing its state of matter. Of course, they can't inherently create or destroy Pathos, they have to use the same ways that everyone else does. Pathos is perhaps the most useful resource that any Wraith has access to because it allows them to heal their corpus and fuel the Arcanoi that they have mastered. And through the powers of usury, it becomes a currency in the complicated economy of the underworld. Practitioners of usury are known as, you know, usurers, and many of them have an uphill battle to fight when it comes to maintaining a stellar reputation. Even though theirs is a high guild because it is required for the economy of Stygia to function, many times it has been corrupted by people who used their powers in less than honorable ways. They would hold wraiths down and sort of suck out their pathos, they would just not pay out what they owed, squeeze wraiths from like their systemic banking monopoly position. I mean the bar is very high, you need to be able to trust your bankers and you need to be able to trust your healers. And usurers are both. And many of them also have the ability to create binding contracts between people or like alter their ghostly credit score. So they're notaries too. The main body of the guild works hard to make sure that any bad actors are sent to the soul forges post haste. But given that many of those bad actors are kind of fucking rich, wealthy, influential, they don't always have the political power to do so. Frequent use of usury will eventually make filigree mathematical markings appear on the body of the practitioner. In an arcane way that really no one could possibly understand other than the usurer themselves, these markings record all of the transactions that have been made by that usurer. We move on to the working guilds, whose arcanoi are not strictly speaking required for the Stygian society to function, but they don't break the dictum mortem and they are often kinda useful, so they're tolerated. Keening is the arcanos that allows practitioners to instill fine-tuned emotional states in other wraiths through song, or sometimes it can also be speech. This is in any horror film when you hear the scary song that's like playing out of nowhere, that's keening. And though this may seem kinda useless, remember that pathos is pretty much the most valuable thing in the underworld and it is generated by inducing emotions. So if you master keening, you have a shortcut to this. Not to mention all the other advantages of being able to play with people's emotions. Many practitioners can even do this in a very subtle way while they're just talking to people. So they don't even know that their heartstrings are being plucked at and they think that they're giving the concessions that they are giving out of the kindness of their own hearts. It was their idea. Practitioners of Keening are known as chanteurs. They are artistes, bards, scalds, if you will, and their services are highly sought after in all strata of society. Any good party or even just a get together needs to have at least one chanteur on staff at least. And the hierarchy considers them very valuable because it allows wraiths to experience many of the things that they would otherwise go to the skinlands for. And also, of course, because 
because of the nature of what they do, they are kind of the economic engine that creates the currency to push back against oblivion and its shadows. Frequent use of keening will eventually manifest in a sort of barely audible shroud of music around the chanteur. What exactly that music sounds like depends highly on the type of wraith and what they have been singing, but frustratingly, it is never really loud enough to be used as background music. Argos is the Arcanos that allows practitioners to navigate the dangerous and unpredictable weather patterns of the Tempest in relative safety. Though it is certainly never comfortable, the Tempest in and of itself is not always deadly. In most places, it's actually rather tame. The problem is its unpredictability and how quickly things can change, which means that pretty much everyone who wanders off into the Tempest is pretty much doomed a lot sooner rather than later. Argos allows wraiths to intuit the patterns of the Tempest and find safe passage through them. Practitioners of Argos are known as Harbingers, and they work mainly as messengers and guides, but also as explorers and logistics specialists. Many, especially the Harbingers themselves, argue that they should be considered a high guild because of how useful their abilities are, but because the byways exist, they're not strictly speaking required for the hierarchy to function. They're more of a convenience, albeit one that Stygian society has come to heavily rely on. No matter if they're in a major necropolis or some small outposts, a harbinger is always going to be able to find work. Some of the more powerful ones can even offer the comfort of vehicular transport through the Tempest. So yes, definitely boats and submarines, but also cars. They can go over the sea because this is the underworld. Frequent use of Argos eventually manifests as a sort of black sheen over the eyes of the practitioner, which grows darker with time. Harbingers with pitch black eyes essentially carry the marks of their experience right on their face. Fatalism is the Arcanos that allows practitioners to perceive the vast and infinitely intricate web of causality detached from time. Advanced practitioners can even manipulate the way that this web is spun, sort of reposition strands on it or otherwise interfere maliciously or beneficially with the fate of any given individual wraith. This ability is very much not spontaneous, but requires quite a bit of ritualism and woo woo to actually engage in. The farther away in time the target of the reading, or the more accurate the reading needs to be, the more woo woo is required. And even then, it is far from a perfect art form. The web of fate changes all of the time, whether that be through natural phenomena or the subtle manipulations of those who know how to do it having huge ripple effects down the line. Practitioners of fatalism are known as oracles, and though there are rather few of them, and they are generally distrusted by Stygian society, their spiritual connection to the Lady of Fate, not to mention the Legion of Fate, whom they help identify candidates that are appropriately deathmarked for them, ensures that they are seen as a necessary piece of social discomfort. Their services are useful to those that can afford them, and obviously, Nobody really wants to piss off someone with the power to manipulate fate. Frequent use of fatalism eventually manifests in certain markings and symbols appearing on the body, similar to what happens with usurers. Except here, they manifest as representations of whatever form of ritualism the oracle in question uses to focus their powers. This is often like laying cards, gazing into crystal balls, reading like tea leaves, but it could also be like differential risk analysis and psychohistory. It really depends on the wraith in question. It's really just a way to get your mind to do what you are trying to make it do. Phantasm is the arcanos that allows practitioners to manipulate the dreams of both the living and the dead. Wraiths do not sleep as such, but they do slumber in their fetters, especially when they're trying to recuperate. Not to mention, Phantasm allows for the creation of real and actually rather complex illusions in the underworld. The core of their power really lies in the manipulation of dreams though, which is a bit of a problem for the hierarchy of course, because the dreams of the living are almost as easily influenced as the dreams of the dead. It is even within the power of Phantasm to drag dreamers down to the underworld to have them experience 
the world of the dead. Though of course when they wake up it was all just a particularly vivid nightmare. But the dictum mortem does not, unlike the masquerade, exist simply for the purpose of keeping the existence of ghosts hidden from the mortal world. Wraiths are not trying to hide among mortals that they prey on. It exists because the hierarchy considers it unethical to interact with the mortal world. And by tormenting them with constant harrowing nightmares, or making them unable to sleep, or unable to wake up, Phantasm users can actually do a whole lot of damage to mortals. Practitioners of Phantasm are known as Sandmen, whether they be men or women or something else entirely. They tend to work in nomadic traveling actor troops where they put on elaborate plays for people to enjoy. But they also often act as healers, both physical and spiritual, which for wraiths of course is kind of the same thing, by improving people's slumber. Frequent use of Phantasm eventually manifests as images projected onto the skin of that wraith, kind of like if it was a, a 3D movie screen. Depending on the thoughts and dreams of that wraith, these can be rather disconcerting, though they're never clear enough to allow other people to sort of read their mind just by looking at them. If anything, the main problem with it is that it leads to a lot of misunderstandings. Now we come to the criminal guilds, the ones whose arts specifically violate the dictum mortem and who really do very little else. Pandemonium is the arcanos that allows practitioners to harness the powers of chaos to create surreal effects in the skinlands. The power of coincidence can be bent to an utterly unreasonable degree, making skittering swarms of cockroaches run down the halls or rivulets of blood drip down the walls. And eventually it can be ripped apart entirely, turning locations in the world into M.C. Escher-esque nightmare scapes where stairs are upside down and hallways seem to stretch on forever as you try to walk through them. Practitioners of Pandemonium are known as Haunters, and given that their Arcanos exists pretty much exclusively to psychologically torture people in the Skinlands, the hierarchy hunts them with very little mercy. Depending on your philosophy, the original goals of this guild were actually somewhat noble. They were trying to weaken the walls between the world of the living and the world of the dead by constantly reminding the living of the existence of the dead. This came as a response to many cultures around the world growing increasingly horrified at the idea of dying, and therefore further and further culturally dissociating themselves from the concept which made the shroud thicker. Many haunters still subscribe to this ideal, believing that a separation is not beneficial to either the living or the dead. Frequent use of pandemonium eventually manifests as a black cloak which the haunters carry around them everywhere they go, and it symbolizes them constantly rubbing up against the shroud. Some practitioners also eventually manifest signs of some of their favorite pandemonium effects that they like to create, like for instance, instance, constantly having bugs crawling all over their corpus. Lifeweb is the arcanos that allows practitioners to manipulate the fetters that bind wraiths to the skinlands, be it their own or the fetters of others. Fetters are powerful and deeply personal objects to wraiths, and they do come with certain costs and disadvantages. Lifeweb allows practitioners to mitigate some of those costs and disadvantages, emulate some of the beneficial effects of fetters, divine information about them, among many other things. This can create both unfathomable corruption and great opportunities for growth, allowing wraiths to change their fetters or allowing wraiths without fetters to travel into the Shadowlands. Practitioners of Lifeweb are known as monitors because their main purpose was for a long time to just keep an eye on the fetters that were located in the Shadowlands. Because yeah, you don't have an inherent sense of what is happening with your fetters. The hierarchy has for a long time used the power of the monitors to control control other wraiths, especially younger ones that tend to have more fetters. So of course, this also means that for a long time, the monitors entrusted with keeping a watchful eye on the fetters of older, more powerful wraiths 
senior members of the hierarchy had a lot of influence over them as well. Because the Guild of Monitors has a sort of habit of practicing their arts in bad faith, very few people trust them anymore. Frequent use of LifeWeb eventually manifests as an inability to blink or close one's eyes at all. This, of course, represents the fact that Monitors are always watching their fetters, no matter where they are. Outrage is the Arcanos that allows practitioners to transform emotional energy into kinetic force. Essentially it is the power of poltergeists, but it is so much more than creating cold spots or rattling pots around. It is done by blasting the shroud with pure pathos energy, sort of like a percussive membrane, which yes, does mean that if you apply too much force, that membrane can rip. Such things pretty much never happen by accident though, because mustering that much force requires a mastery of the arcano so great that anyone who can do that is also fine-tuned enough to make extremely small dexterous manipulations like typing on a touchscreen from beyond the shroud. Outrage is also useful in the underworld where the effects can be rather similar. If anything, the shroud is a problem that's in the way. Practitioners of outrage are known as spooks in the underworld, and to make sure they never become a force to be reckoned with, the powers that be have invested a lot of time and energy into keeping them divided. Their guild, which originally was an offshoot of the Haunters Guild, is divided into countless squabbling factions that effectively act as ghost mafias running protection rackets. Because of the powerful emotions constantly rattling around within them, the spooks tend to be somewhat uh, you know, not well adjusted emotionally speaking, and so they're often considered a liability even if they are powerful warriors. And many take this like a little step further by effectively acting as shock troops against the hierarchy's dominance and a lot of more isolated necropoli. Frequent use of outrage eventually manifests in the Wraith becoming hella buff and ripped. So yeah, in Wraith you can become a bodybuilder by being emotionally dysregulated, which, you know, to be fair, that's already how a lot of bodybuilders do it, so they will feel right at home. Embody is the Arcanos that allows practitioners to physically exist in the Skinlands. Yeah. You heard that shit, right? A lot of Arcanoi are about messing around with the Shroud. This one is about passing through it. Beginners in learning the powers of this Arcanos will barely be able to whisper to their greatest loved ones that they had in life. Masters can physically become their corpus in the Skinlands and run around as a physical being. If you have been paying any sort of attention at all, you will understand that this power is both extremely sought after because it gives wraiths the exact thing that they all want, and also deeply illegal as an utterly blatant violation of the dictum mortem. Seriously, almost every ghost just craves the experience of being human in the Skinlands one more time, of not being dead, and the hierarchy cannot let this happen. Practitioners of Embody are known as Proctors, and precisely because they have this gift that everybody wants, they really don't have a lot of time to share it. That and also the fact that they have to be extremely secretive because they're, you know, deeply persecuted. All that being said, even the hierarchy eventually has need of sending a physical envoy into the Skinlands, or of bringing someone, usually some type of supernatural being, back into the underworld. Secret avenues of communication between the Guild of Proctors and the highest floors of the hierarchy exist for this exact reason. Frequent use of Embody eventually manifests in a representation of whatever stimulus the Proctor most frequently seeks out in the Skinlands. These tend to appear long before any Proctor gains the ability to fully immerse themselves in the real world. So for most of their career, basically, they have to pick and choose what they experience. So a Proctor who loves just experiencing the wind might have like their hair being flying back all the time, which is cool, really. Someone who loves the feeling of soft fabrics might have their skin turn into cashmere wool. These markings do not satisfy the cravings that they represent. If anything, they are a constant reminder of what is lost in the Shadowlands.
existence. Puppetry is the arcanos that allows practitioners to control living bodies in the skinlands. This usually means mortal humans, but it can also mean animals or other types of supernatural beings for those extremely skilled in the craft. Some can even exert a level of control that mortals themselves don't even have over their bodies, like lowering their temperature or controlling the pace at which their heart beats. Though the most forbidden of these abilities is the power to completely destroy the soul of a mortal and take over their body until it wears out. It lags behind Embody in the sense that many of the experiences of the Skinlands are still dulled, but it also provides a sense of corporeality that Embody cannot. Practitioners of puppetry are known as puppeteers, and they are a fairly young guild formed only very shortly before the attempted coup d'etat by all of the other guilds, mainly because of the sheer and utter hatred Charon personally had for all practitioners of this power. The Death Lords, however, agree and recognize that puppetry can, in very rare situations, be extremely useful to actually upholding the Dictum Mortem. It can be a very useful form of damage control. Puppeteers can make human bodies heal in ways in which medicine cannot, because they can't control those specific healing systems, and the ghosts can. And also, they can use the knowledge of the bodies that they occupy in the Shadowlands. Sometimes, there are rips in the shrouds, and sometimes those rips lead basically straight to oblivion, which is just a worst case scenario. The first scenario is already terrible enough. And more than once have groups of nosy mortals been made to turn away from such rips for their own safety by a lone, valiant puppeteer able to control several people at once. Frequent use of puppetry eventually manifests into physical features of the people that the wraith has possessed merging into their own corpus. And if that includes includes animals, the results can be rather interesting. And finally, we come to the Forbidden Guilds, which are more illegal than the Criminal Guilds. And they concern dictum mortem breaking arcanoi that the hierarchy either has no use for, or which they consider so dangerous that they are not to be kept around in any way, shape, or form. They're kind of like biological weapons, essentially. These three were not even recognized as guilds at any point. The official, real, actual arcanoi that exist according to the hierarchy are only the previous 13. If the hierarchy finds out you are a practitioner, of any of the following Arcanoi, it is straight to the Soul Forges with you, baby. Flux is the Arcanos that allows practitioners to manipulate the properties of matter, and also work with relics that have been imported from the Skinlands to the Shadowlands. Though mainly it can be used to alter things like weight, matter, and composition in all manner of objects. To a much more limited extent, even in the Skinlands. But the primary use for this Arcanos is really to take things from the Skinlands and transform them into things which properly exist in the Shadowlands. This is not always particularly precise, and a major part of the Flux toolkit is actually to have a sort of sixth sense for the presence of these relics as they occur naturally and what they are, what they represent. Some might even say that they talk to relics. And then of course being able to change the aspects of those relics is very handy because a lot of those, they're pretty rare and often they're just objects with they're not particularly useful. Practitioners of Flux are known as alchemists and you might be asking yourself, why the fuck is this a forbidden guild? Literally all of the criminal guilds are way more blatant violations of the dictum mortem. And, uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, the reason is politics. You see, most of the applications of Flux are also covered in some way by various aspects of other Arcanoi, albeit often in a rather imperfect manner. So, really, Flux is useful to do a whole bunch of very specialized things that a whole bunch of other guilds would really prefer to keep a monopoly on. Flux used to be considered a sort of sub-Arcanos of Inhabit as it was developed, but eventually the Alchemists and the Artificers had a bit of a falling out. So a bunch of guilds banded together and used their political power to make sure that no one could ever use Flux again, legally speaking. Frequent use of Flux eventually manifests as parts 
of the user's body beginning to look manufactured. This could be sophisticated cybernetic arms, but also wooden legs that they still work like regular legs. They're just made out of wood. Mimosinus is the arcanos that allows practitioners to read, alter, and delete the memories of others. Perhaps the most feared and most hated of guilds, not just because of the obvious applications for their power, but also, need I remind you, that everything in the underworld is made of memories. So not only can these guys basically use your mind as a hard drive that they have root access to, copying, pasting, altering, deleting, creating, whatever they want, they can literally obliterate Literate someone from existence by making everyone they have known forget about them. And this includes mortals. Practitioners of mnemonicism are known as Nemoi, and they actually used to be one of the most important guilds in the entire underworld. One of the most important institutions in the Dark Kingdom of Iron. They were the judges and the interrogators of the hierarchy. Up until the precise moment where they realized they were the true masters of literally every single secret and bit of information and started to use that power for their own gain. They gaslit a whole society and they were very good at it. It was extremely difficult to excise them and some even continue to operate to this day. Or, you know, perhaps the idea that they were excised is simply exactly what they want you to believe. The notion that they are now a forbidden guild that has no sort of power and is actively persecuted by the incessant grind of the hierarchy. You know, all of the institutions that you trust, they're actually against this thing. It is not the thing that is controlling them, definitely, that is not happening. Frequent use of mnemonicism eventually manifests in aspects of the Wraith's corpus having crystalline qualities. Whether that be teeth, smooth and shining like mirrors, rims of crystal dust around their neck, or footsteps that sound like breaking glass. The Nemoi today go to great lengths to conceal their dark power, and with good reason. Even for the other Arcanoi, there's only like a 90% chance that you will go to the Soul Forges immediately. This one has like a hundred percent. And finally, Intimation is the Arcanos that allows practitioners to understand, interpret, alter, and manipulate the feelings and emotions of all thinking beings. I say that because it really very much does work on every other kind of being as well, not just ghosts, also humans, vampires, werewolves. But it is of course especially dangerous to wraiths because those things are factors that define their entire existence. They are made of emotions. The reason a wraith is at all is because they want and desire. To alter a wraith's wants and desires is to fundamentally alter who they are. At least when the Nemoi fuck with your memories, they will leave you as a person intact. Practitioners of intimation are known as solicitors, and you may be surprised to hear that some wraiths actually very highly value their services. After all, the need to, like, change yourself to be able to transcend to the whatever comes after death is the whole reason you're stuck in this whole underworld situation in the first place. The Solicitor's Guild, even though it is definitely willing to offer these kinds of services for anyone daring enough to ask, have no interest in anyone's transcendence. Their goal, and they are actively working toward this, is to undermine all of the hierarchy and become the true shadow government that rules Stygian society. And they are not content to confining their activities solely to the underworld. They meddle in the affairs of humans, mages, vampires, all the time, breaking the dictum mortem in the most subtle, yet also the most thorough ways. Short of being just a forbidden guild, the solicitors are on an institutional level an enemy of the hierarchy and everything it represents. Frequent use of intimation eventually manifests as a wraith's left eye glowing permanently green. You'd think that this would kind of give them away somewhat easily, but the underworld is a weird place, and there's a lot of weird looking people there, and the solicitors have figured out a lot of methods to practice their subterfuge 
from afar. And that is it. That's all the basics of Wraith Law, all the legions and the guilds and the idea of what this is about in one video. You should have a basic grasp of this setting now if you try to do more research on it, dive deeper into it, which is definitely an option. You should be able to at least contextualize most of the things that you encounter. Now, if you want to find out what happened to the mainline continuity of Wraith after the year 1999, I would recommend looking into Orpheus. It was a limited run RPG, so from the very beginning it was only supposed to be this many books that would come out for it. It wasn't an open-ending setting. And the point of it was that you kind of, uh, let's be serious, a group of mages, at least in, in some capacity, who found a method of astrally projecting into the underworld. And they would do that for money, to, like, get rid of hauntings and shit like that. And also the process kind of involved them dying, so you kind of also, they were ghosts, but it was also the point that they would be brought back. So you would technically be playing living people, but also kind of not, which the line being blurred in this case is kind of the point of the whole exercise. But also most of Orpheus doesn't even concern the actual Shadowlands even, but an antechamber essentially to the Shadowlands, because the end of the Wraith continuity made the Shroud so thick that many Wraiths themselves cannot even pass through it. So, for the most part, it is not entirely clear what even happened to the Underworld and everything in it. The sources conflict like any good World of Darkness type situation, that's also kind of the point of it. Essentially, there's more than one viable scenario. I personally see this like that one vampire campaign book where at the end you can have a, a frenzying vampire of the second generation rampaging across the world. Or that same vampire could like be in the tomb and just mega chill, like yeah, what's up? And confirm a, a very specific version of Gehenna as being true. Or the, the coffin could just be empty, there could just be ashes in there. And the second generation, by the way, is the generation before the third generation, the antediluvians, which are the progenitors of the clans. This is someone who was personally embraced by Cain. There's also a bunch of other possible endings and none of them have really seemed to come to pass in the main line of Vampire the Masquerade 5. This whole thing is kind of why I don't really like metaplots in the first place, and you can and should ignore them. If in your post-1999 chronicle the politics of the underworld are exactly the same, they're exactly the same. If some things have changed, some things have changed. If you, based on all of the things that you've heard, have a new cool idea of what it could have changed into, or possibly even what it was always like, do it. Straight, just do it. I'm not the fucking law police. Right, because even if the hierarchy did collapse, wraiths are not known to be particularly fond of sweeping innovation, as evidenced by the fact that the guilds still exist, even though they're outlawed. Even if the hierarchy collapsed, the legions have been such a driving cultural force, I don't think that everything about them would just go away overnight. And quite frankly, if you're running vampire, None of that, like, ghost politics, deep underworld shit should really enter the discourse around the table at all. Not even international Camarilla Sabat politics shenanigans do, so why should fucking ghost underworld politics? Maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't run wraiths and how they work in a fundamentally different way. That is fully up to you to decide. World of Darkness is not D&D. &D. Even if a character is for some reason extremely knowledgeable about ghosts, the extent of that knowledge should still be limited to things that are relevant to ghosts as they exist in the Skinlands. The reason all this lore was written down and is available for us to read is twofold. For one, it's cool. It, let's just be honest, but it, it fucking rules to be sitting at your computer at 3am reading about the masks of the Death Lords 
or the theories of the coffins of the Talmay Ra, or cyclical Gehenna ideas. The use of that deep lore that will never enter your game is that it's cool. Oh yeah, and about the masks, by the way, those are not like official artwork. I like clobbered those together in Photoshop and Stable Diffusion. But aside from the coolness, uh, this information exists so we can utilize the most effective technique at creating an atmosphere of mystery in a World of Darkness game. Imagine the sea, right? Or any body of water that's deep enough that light only penetrates so far. It could be a lake too, I don't care. The point is you don't know how deep it is. You can see the things that are happening around you pretty clearly, but the farther out you look in that direction, and especially the farther out you look in this direction, the more cloudy, dark, murky, and more difficult to penetrate they become. And anything beyond that is even more difficult to make out. You could dive down there, get a closer look. It's not like you need to breathe. You might learn something, secrets to great power, but going down there is dangerous. And even when you are in those depths, though you may be able to see the particular thing that you were trying to look at more easily, Everything else around you is now a whole lot darker. And every once in a while, in the darkness even farther below, something stirs. You have no idea what it is, how big it is, what it wants, if it wants anything, but you do know that it is definitely there and that you are looking at some little bit of it. And quite frankly, you probably don't even really want to know. You just want to get the fuck back to the surface, out of the water ideally. Now the former is possible, the latter is not. If you are a being of the night, no matter if werewolf or vampire or whatever of the many things that exist, there is no land for you to return to. You are stuck in the water for good. And you are stuck here with whatever it was that stirred down there. And the more time you spend in the water, the more you realize that it's far from the only thing that's stirring down there. And who knows what even bigger things lie beneath your feet. That is the sublime cosmic horror aspect that weaves into the personal horror aspect of any good World of Darkness game. So I sometimes storytellers will sprinkle in some aspect that hints at something greater with whatever it is that you're currently interfacing with. Something you couldn't even begin to understand. And if this lore helps you in building that atmosphere of mystery, Fantastic. Otherwise, use it however you please. Thank you very much for watching this video. Like, comment, subscribe, share this to your relevant communities, but do not spam them. Consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar, buying some of my merchandise or my short story collection. And in that spirit, I really, I really didn't expect this to be uh, this long. I just wanted to do the thing, and then I, oh, you could also add the legions, and oh, you talk about the thing a little bit, and the underworld, the politics, off here, and then suddenly, boom. <sighs> I'm gonna get this out in 2022 still, that's gonna happen. And see you around, cunts.